it's Jane Marie, host of the Dream Podcast. And guess what? We have a brand new season out right now. Previously, we've looked at multi-level marketing and wellness. And this season, we're diving into the world of coaches, life coaches. And I'm getting one because life has been kind of meh since the pandemic. And I really, really want to feel better and be better. Listen to The Dream on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hello there, and welcome to the Inside Health Podcast with me, James Gallagher. And I'm going to take you on a little trip. A warm welcome. Thanks for coming here today. My name is Liam Modlin. I'm a psychology and psychotherapy lead in psychedelics at the Psychoactive Trials Group at King's College London. No, thank you very much for inviting me in, Liam, because this is where the psychedelic research happens, isn't it? And that's what we're having a look at in the whole of this episode of Inside Health, whether it can actually be a big breakthrough in the field of mental health research and treatment. So where am I? You're at the clinical trials facility at King's College Hospital, and you are currently in our dosing room. We're going to be talking a lot about psychedelics and how they could revolutionize mental health. So first of all, let's be clear, what are psychedelics? Well, here's psychiatrists James Rucker and first David Arizzo. The more classic psychedelics, they are psilocybin, which exists in magic mushrooms or magic truffles, DMT, which is the psychedelic active compound in a psychedelic brew used in the Amazonian cultures uh, called ayahuasca and we are using that in trials to test it for depression as well. Mescaline is coming from the Piotr cactus and then LSD synthetic compound developed around the Second World War in Switzerland. Then you also have 5-MeO-DMT toxin from a toad in nature. So you have all these different compounds. So a psychedelic drug is a type of drug that has a specific effect in the brain stimulates a certain type of serotonin receptor in the brain in an unusual way and this results in quite a profound and unusual experience that can be mystical very pleasurable but also anxiety provoking people can misperceive things even hallucinate it's a characteristic state and it's defined by this pharmacological mechanism of action, this action at this specific type of serotonin receptor. And that is what a psychedelic is. We'll hear a lot more from James and David later as we explore this cutting edge of modern psychiatry. Because despite the talk about mystical experiences, this is far from a 1960s drug fueled lovin'. Much of the work into psychedelic treatment is still at the research stage, but the most promising results have been in cases of depression when other treatments just haven't worked. And later this year, it's happening for the first time in Australia. Psychiatrists will be able to prescribe MDMA, so that's ecstasy, as well as psilocybin, which is the chemical found in magic mushrooms. And Liam Modlin has used the drugs in his clinic. As you can see, it's a very different room than your normal psychotherapy NHS clinic. I have to say, it is nicer than my bedroom. There's like mood lighting, little candles everywhere, battery-powered ones, no flames. Aromatherapy, what's the smell? But currently, it's lavender. Lavender, lovely. Nice bed, weighted blanket, rainforest scenes on the background. It's kind of like, I think every hospital room should be like this. I agree. How does it make you feel to be in this room? I'm very calm in here. I want to I wanna crawl on the bed. Can I jump on? Yeah, please, make yourself okay. comfortable. Oh, I'm really in danger of falling asleep in there. Well, that's the intent um, behind it. Um, so a comfortable setting uh, seems to be conducive to feelings of safety and relaxation and really making the most out of the experience. So you've got to be here basically from before the drug's taken until the drug's worn off. That's correct. Okay, so when I come in when would you get the psychedelic therapy the, the drug, drug itself. itself yeah the drug itself you'll probably get it around 9 a.m in the morning and we invite participants to come around around 8 a.m we check in with them there's final physical exams ask them about their current state of mind we take informed consent then we administer the psychedelic but importantly with psychedelic therapy the process starts a lot earlier, weeks before, when we start the preparation phase, and they meet with their therapist, and they practice some of the techniques and skills that we think seem to be helpful for participants to make the most out of the experience, ensure psychological safety, and gear them up for a meaningful day. 
Now, if you've been enjoying the music in this episode, it was composed by Ian Rulia. He tried multiple treatments for his depression before taking psilocybin in clinical trials. He now runs an advocacy group called Saipan for people who've had psychedelic therapy. So I've taken part in two clinical trials. The first one was in 2015, and that was the pilot study. And that involved two doses of psilocybin, one 10 milligram dose, and a week later, a 25 milligram dose. And the 10 milligram dose, I was able to resist, didn't let go. I didn't let the drug fully take hold of me. Mm -hmm. And that's how really you get the most potential from psilocybin is to let go you know go with the flow yeah yeah there's a saying that really helped me during the phrase they used was in and through we're like whatever comes up the first dose i was scared i felt frozen and i was like i need to retain control Mm. because letting go is going to be the end of me you know um did the second attempt were yeah. better. So for the second dose, I would say because it's two and a half times stronger, I didn't have as much choice Ability whether to, yeah. to let go or not. That's why maybe a higher dose is needed mm. because I, I see my depression now as a clinging on, as a, a way of trying to control and push these feelings and thoughts and emotions away. And it never works. They never disappear. So psilocybin, it forces me to relinquish my grip to let go. We are here the whole day, so the participant is never left alone. There's always a therapist at their side. And the role of the therapist on the day is supportive. So we might practice in preparation some breathing exercises, for example, that on the day with the psychedelic can be very, very helpful. Let's have a go. Let's have a go. I invite you to make yourself comfortable. I already have. I invite you then to close your eyes. Okay. And just start by taking a slow, gentle in-breath. And release gently when it feels right for you. Toes for the day. Trust, let go and be open. All is welcome. Go in and through. And Liam, how long would it take when you were in here to start having a psychedelic experience after you take the drug? Normally we can think between 15 minutes to 60 minutes you will start feeling some of the subjective effects. Sometimes it could be subtle, sometimes it can be transient nausea, a bit of a headache, a bit of discomfort or other feelings of relaxation and calm. And then you also might start noticing some audio or visual changes and sometimes a lot of participants are also wearing the eye shades and they're listening to music and they might report a different kind of quality to the music that they're hearing and we prepare participants to use that moments where consciousness becomes altered somehow uh, to welcome it to be curious about it to be open to it to make the most of the experience and what's your role in here for eight hours on the day itself, my role is supportive. The it's novel the potential for it to be really unsettling, isn't it? It can also be unsettling, and in a way it might be, and we're still investigating it, something about the confrontation with what is unsettling and working through it and processing it as opposed to avoiding it is part of the healing mechanisms for those who respond to treatment. So during both trials, during all three doses, because there was one dose in the second trial, a similar pattern, really, of resisting initially. I remember the high dose thinking, I never want to feel like this again, I want this to stop. But the team were around me, they knew the difficulty I had during the first dose, Mm. and they were like, you know, in and through, whatever comes up, you know, approach it, go into it. And I literally looked my demons in the eye. I saw my abusive father and they encouraged me to go towards that thought of my father. And it was terrifying, it was horrible. But by doing that, by going towards, I saw him for what he really was. Not this omniscient figure that could crush me. He was just, uh, the words that came to my head were just a, a pathetic little wretch. The opposite of what I thought. And I thought it'd be the end of me. But by being able to face him, 
I realised that I could face anything. But after that, it wasn't like I entered a space of blissful happiness. It was that I entered a space where I knew that I was equipped to face any emotion that came up and I could welcome it with open arms and I could go, you know, in and through whatever came up. So I had many different phases within that. Tears were as valid as laughter. And there were moments during that that I did feel this this kind of blissful calm. You know, and for somebody that's been depressed for so many years, that was such a huge revelation to me. It was the first time I'd ever felt self-compassion. And because if, you're, if you feel connected to every living thing, that therefore includes you. You can't leave yourself off that list of every living thing. And I felt, for the first time, you know, a deep compassion and love for myself. And so you went on quite an yeah. emotional roller coaster from yeah. very dark places yeah. to yeah. some very hopeful, optimistic ones. Yeah. I don't know if I would have been able to have got to those places without the team around me. Because it's the therapy as well as the drug that's the yeah, important thing. precisely. Yeah. I think that's why I was able to have the courage to, to go through those really dark periods and get to that lighter place. You can really hear from Ian, can't you, how much work goes into this, both from Ian and from the therapist. It's not just pop a pill and everything's fine. So I caught up with Liam Maudlin again, as well as with Dr James Rucker, who's a consultant psychiatrist at King's College London. And it became clear that using psychedelics is not a new idea. The human race has a long and complicated history of these drugs. Psilocybin in particular has been used in spiritual and ceremonial healing rituals in geographically distinct tribes around the world. So there's something common there that the human race is interacting with, this sense of mysticism or spirituality maybe that these drugs have a tendency to elicit. But then, of course, we picked up the story in the Western world with the discovery of LSD, and that was in, well, 1938 originally, but 1943 was when its psychoactive properties were discovered. It's worth remembering the state psychiatry was in back then in terms of treatment. You're going to have to remind me. What, what existed, very little. But ultimately, that was why we had asylums, because we didn't know how to treat mental illness. So LSD was of particular interest. And it was particular interest because it mimics some of the effects seen in schizophrenia, some of the symptoms of acute psychosis. Not all of them, but just some of them. And that was really interesting because it challenged the paradigm of the time that was predominantly psychoanalytic. Suddenly here was a biological agent, a drug, causing some of the symptoms of a disorder that hitherto had been understood in psychoanalytic terms. So in a funny way, it wasn't just LSD, of course, there were lots of other things going on at the same time. LSD kind of ushered in modern psychopharmacology. Why did it disappear as an idea? Or why is it only relatively recently come back? LSD was used quite extensively in psychiatry between 1950 and 1970. But psychedelics were then caught up in what was essentially a moral panic around psychoactive drugs. And there are a series of UN conventions that wanted to control the trade in nar narcotic substances. And LSD and cannabis and various other drugs that we see are very stigmatised today were caught up in all of that and were prohibited. And they were prohibited in the sense not only for, for recreational use, but also for medical use. And that's what killed it. And Liam, it's all very exciting now, though, isn't it? It is exciting. And one of the things that I appreciate about working within clinical trials is that we also mitigate the excitement and with some serious science and really to try to get a sense of how these compounds affect patients, how they work in the brain, but also what they seem to elicit for patients that have been suffering for sometimes decades. And James mentioned an LSD. And in the first paper in 1950 that was published in English, LSD in the treatment, I think, of alcoholism, the conclusion there was that LSD may be an aid to shortening psychotherapy. So in a way, we are definitely picking up from, from where we left. Picking up the baton from the 1950s. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other thing that strikes me that James, James was mentioning, how, how, you know, go back a century and there were patients that we just didn't know what to do with. Even today, there are people that we try everything with and it doesn't make a difference. We're still not able to treat some people with severe 
depression. Yes, correct. And, and a lot of the patients that we see in our trials, they are by definition treatment resistant. And there's something about the interaction of psychedelics and the psychological support that may help them get in touch with self-empowerment or hope for the future. Run me through the trial data because you, you've published on the effectiveness of psilocybin in people that don't respond to depression. Mm -hmm. What yeah. were the results? People were all given psychological support and they were all given psilocybin. They were just randomized to three doses. And what you get is this dose dependent separation between the three doses. And the largest dose, 25 milligram dose, statistically separates from the lowest dose for six weeks. And it's clinically significant. A little under a third of people go into remission. That's a big deal when it comes to depression that has not got better for years or has been resistant to many, many treatments. You know, you don't normally see that in a trial. But it wasn't so amazing that I was thinking that's not clinically credible. James, because I think, did you say that you noticed the difference between the different groups for six weeks and then you no longer noticed the difference? After? Some people don't respond. Some people respond a bit, but not very much. Some people have profound experiences um, that seem to shift their perspective quite fundamentally, and that has positive effects for months, even years. It's no panacea, though. I think that's a really important point because there's a huge amount of hype and even wild speculation around using psychedelics in mental health, and yet it's clear they don't work for everyone. Now, there are larger trials underway, and they'll give us a clearer picture of the effectiveness. But for a moment now, I just want to delve deep inside the brain because what I want to know is, what are these psychedelics doing? How might they be beneficial in mental health? So I caught up with Dr. David Arizzo, who's the clinical director at the Centre for Psychedelic Research at Imperial College London. David, welcome to the Inside Health Studio. Thanks for coming in. Thank you very much for having me. Now, David, I've got a big challenge for you, and it's the whole reason you're here, is to explain the complicated neuroscience of how these drugs work and why they might be useful therapeutically. Yeah. It's a small question. It's really. a small, small <laughs> question, and it's difficult, and obviously we have scraped the top of the iceberg, but I think it's useful to think about that they seem to have quite cross-diagnostic potential, whether we speak about addictions or depression or anxiety or OCD. They are being tested and look promising for non-psychotic mental health conditions. That's because they're dealing with some kind of like common feature of all of those. Across all these conditions, you have maladaptive thought patterns and maladaptive behaviours where you're trapped in entrenched thinking and behaviours. could be that you have very negative self-image and thoughts about yourself and you're stuck in it. What we think that the psychedelics are doing, and we have some data to support things in that direction, instead of having top-down control of how we perceive and understand ourselves in the world and the world around us, it might be more like a bottom-up phenomenon where the psychedelics allow for other things to come up and reshape these models. And there are different data to support that. So that's a quite dominant theory at the moment. We can even see that the brain hierarchy is collapsing during psychedelics. So What's the brain hierarchy? You have sort of part of the brain's cortex, which is processing assumption and beliefs about the world and ourselves. And then you have sort of lower in that hierarchy, you have more sensory and emotional areas. And we can see that collapsing during the psychedelic experience. So if you see the brain as a mountain landscape, the valleys and the mountains, if they are very deep and high, it's, you will be trapped in specific patterns and paths moving around. And we can see a flattening of that landscape, so it's easier to move around. We can see that in healthy people. And now we have very much more recent data looking at depression. And what we can see there, if we measure how these different brains network relate to each, to each other, yeah, we can see that brain becomes overall more integrated. The very flexible brain state allows for a flattening of that landscape. So if you have very high mountains and very deep valleys, you are almost enforced to take specific paths to get around. It's too difficult to climb all these mountains, so you get sort of trapped in these different routes through the landscape. And in a way, the valleys are lifted a bit, the mountains are reduced in the acute psychedelic state. And that allows for different paths to be taken. If your brain is currently forcing you to take a path through the deep dark woods or some somewhere horrible than that flattening the changing of the landscape of the brain during the psychedelic treatment allows, allows you to chart a new route yeah exactly and it might even be that some of those changes are somewhat enduring and we have seen the more this landscape is flattening 
the more therapeutic effects we see in these depressed patients in the trials. It needs to be replicated and understood further. Is it a bit like my mug right now? And if this was a depressed mug rather than a brain, it's a little bit like taking it back to its clay putty-like states where you can remould it and then put it back in the kiln in order to change what it's like. Yeah, yeah, you could say that. It's a reshaping your, your mug a bit and putting it back in the oven so that it can be long-lasting because one of the really fascinating things that really speaks, I would say, to a paradigm shift in terms of treatment and psychiatry is that a single intervention or very, very few interventions have long-lasting effects. So you have ketamine already for depression. The effects after a single intervention typically a week or two. And here we potentially it's like they're even longer lasting with the classic psychedelics when used for intervention. So you, you have a drug that induces a really fascinating psychological experiences and we can see that the nature and the profoundness of those experiences seem to be predictive of the therapeutic outcome. And we see long-lasting effects after single interventions. Those things combined speak to a very different paradigm from what we're used to. David, thank you so much for coming in the studio and for tolerating my hideous analogies about mugs. <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Well, that's how psychedelics might work in the brain as we continue to spend this edition of Inside Health exploring whether these drugs could transform the treatment of mental health. Now, we heard from Ian earlier who took part in the trials. This is how he's feeling now. I still struggle with depression now. I felt depression and anxiety free for three months afterwards fully and then that gradually tailed off between three and six months. That three months... Mm. Had you ever had a period like that before? No. Would there be glimmers, moments maybe, and you could have like a nice few hours with a friend or enjoy music more fully or whatever, but really there was never a period of time where that cloud parted, that weight lifted, mm. you know. But having three months free of depression was... Oh, it was amazing. It wasn't like I felt like a different person. And this is where some of those threads carried over into my normal daily life, those feelings of I can face anything that comes up, any emotion, any thought, and I'll approach it openly with compassion, that carried on. That feeling of being connected to nature and other people and myself, that carried through as well. And to just really simple things, like being able to have a conversation with somebody and not instantly walk away from that conversation, tearing it to pieces, going all the anxieties going, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I trusted myself. It was like I felt able to be myself more than I ever had before. And what happened after those three months, Ian? During the three to six month period afterwards, I call it an afterglow, literally things feel lighter, things even look lighter. You know, the leaves on the trees are shining back at you, the sun feels that bit more intense. Mm. You're just more alive. When that starts to fade you start to feel yourself grasping. So there were certain things I did to reconnect myself to that state. A large part of that was the playlist of music that was really key to the whole experience during the trial and afterwards. So that was a way of me getting back into that place or reconnecting with that place. You can feel that maybe the, the clouds are coming back together, the weight is growing heavier again, I think there's a lot more emphasis now on what they call integration work. So after the trial, the team looked after me as best they could. When the trial comes to an end, there has to be a definite end to that. This is what we're trying to work on with Saipan, the organisation that I've set up with next trial participant. There's an increasing awareness that integration work is needed after the the trial itself after the dosing day so that's where somebody takes the new connections they've made during those sessions and uses those to make small subtle changes to their their daily habits and their their life in general so that's that's the way that these breakthroughs these epiphanies can actually have a lasting effect we're also looking to connect trial participants like ourselves with each other because the fact that people can't access the treatment after the trial is over can be a huge problem in itself. When you finally found something that actually helps you and helps to alleviate your depression and then you can't legally access it, it can create an even deeper level of hopelessness.
perhaps there is a need for for a change in the law for people that have experienced the benefits of psilocybin during a clinical trial to be able to access psilocybin afterwards. So Ian, do you feel like it's really made a difference? I would say, even since the first trial, the way that I perceive my depression changed forever. I saw my depression as a cancer that I wanted to cut out of myself. I realised through the trial that depression is really about my ongoing relationship with myself. It softened the bottom. The bottom is still low. When I feel really low, it's still really bad. But there's a bit of cushioning there now. And also, I know that self-compassion is possible. And that helps in itself. Even though it's very hard to do, I know that I have felt that way. And just knowing that I have felt that way helps me feel a little better about like myself. Like get there again. Yeah, yeah. There's that glimmer of hope. There's an ember there. All is not dark and lost. There's an ember still there. Well, Ian, all I can do is wish you the best for the future and hope everything Thank goes you. well for you. Thanks, Thanks so for coming much. In. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Well, we've talked a lot about treatment-resistant depression because that's where trials of psilocybin are the most advanced. But scientists think psychedelic drugs can do so much more in conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder or obsessive-compulsive disorder. And a trial on the eating disorder anorexia nervosa is about to start. Hello, I'm Dr. Hubertus Himmerich. I'm a clinical senior lecturer in eating disorders at King's College London. How big a need is there for a different way of approaching anorexia treatment? The need is immense because anorexia nervosa is still the mental disorder with the highest mortality. Psychological treatments don't have a very good outcome. And if we find a medication that can enhance the effect of psychotherapy, that would be fantastic. So, Hubertus, what's happening inside the brain if you have anorexia that you're hoping that psilocybin might be able to help change? People who are suffering from anorexia nervosa are obsessed with food, with burning calories all the time. And they are completely ruled by the anorexia. It affects their life, their relationships, and they are living just to satisfy the disorder. When they have the experience with psilocybin, we hope and we assume that people will experience the richness of their inner world and they will experience that they have so many more ideas and could have so many plans for their life. And this could give them hope for the future, it could increase and improve their mood and motivate them to fight against the disorder and to get their life back. And are you basing that idea that it could work for anorexia nervosa because you see similarities with other diseases that have more evidence in or have there been enough early kind of like one-off case reports that allow you to think that there's something promising here? A very small study has been done in anorexia nervosa and during this very small trial they could observe that patients with anorexia nervosa were able to think about other things than their own body weight and body shape and they were able to focus on other ideas and make plans. So that means we have evidence from trials and other mental health disorders, but we also have preliminary evidence in anorexia itself. So you're hopeful? Yeah, I'm very hopeful for this trial. Hubertus, thank you so much for talking to me. Oh, thank you. That's anorexia nervosa, and again, the idea is to use psilocybin, that ingredient in magic mushrooms, to unlock the brain and make it more open to therapy. While the drug is also being used to help us understand our own brains better, Professor Gronja McCallanan from King's College is using the drugs to understand autism. 
What I'm trying to do is build up a chemical profile of the human brain and how that might be different in people who have neurodivergent conditions. So we're not actually investigating psychedelics per se. We're using psychedelics as a tool to understand the brain chemistry of autistic conditions and indeed neurodiversity as a whole. To give you some context, we think that the serotonin system, which psilocybin works on, is potentially different in people who have an autistic condition. But one way we can test that theory is to use something that works in the serotonin system and see if it elicits a difference in function. And the functions that we're interested in targeting are functions like sensory processing and the way the brain networks work together. Because we think those are more foundational processes that basically cascade into more complex behaviours that we understand as the autistic condition or indeed any human condition. You mentioned sensory processing. How different can that be between a kind of neurotypical and an autistic brain? What we're finding in our uh, studies is it can be quite different at the level of sensory processing. In general, what we're seeing is that sometimes the autistic brain keeps on responding to stimuli where a non-autistic brain may have suppressed that response. We think that may have something to do with perceptual difficulties that people report. And it's, it's quite interesting because people report a whole range of sensory perceptual differences. Um, they could be underreactive to certain sens sensory um, stimuli or overreactive. That's why we are super interested in trying to tackle that sensory processing piece because our sensory systems are the very first things that are developing when we're young and we think that the origins of neurodivergence may um, date right back to when we're young and sensory systems are um, developing. Can you give me like an example from day-to-day -day life because sometimes it can be like loud noises are just too much, can't it, things like that. Some people may complain about the hand dryers in a, in a bathroom and that may be actually one of the first things maybe a parent notices with a child. They simply can't take them into the bathroom because it, when they're out and about because the hand dryer will elicit an enormously you know, excessive overreaction and cause a lot of distress. Ambulance sirens are another common one, the hoover, but also noises that might not disturb anyone else. And therefore, it makes it very difficult for some people um, who have an autistic spectrum condition to navigate the world because um, non-autistic people don't really get why something trivial is actually causing them a lot of discomfort and distress. There's no suggestion here that you actually want to use psilocybin therapeutically, even if you would want to? So the issue in, in autism research is not everything is about finding a, a clinical trial mm. target, but a lot of people do want some sorts of choices. And at the moment, there are very limited choices. Individuals may tell us they would like some help with some of the more distressing aspects of their condition, perhaps, you know, sensory difficulties, because those kinds of difficulties can feed into other problems and lay the seeds of mental health difficulties, for example, or perhaps make social interaction difficult. So we think we shouldn't go straight into a clinical trial with out understanding the science and understanding the chemical systems we're actually working on. So this is a, a kind of first step or a preclinical trial experimental study that tells us actually in some people with an autistic condition, are there real differences in the way the serotonin system regulates these important functions, sensory function or brain connectivity, for example? I've tried to give you a taste of some of the different ways that psilocybin is being used for research and how much potential people think that it has. But let's bring our attention back to depression, which really does seem like the closest to being used as a treatment. Now, Compass Pathways is one of the companies at the forefront of developing it as a therapy. My name is Kabir Nath, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Compass Pathways. Kabir, welcome to Inside Health. Thanks very much, James. How many trials are you currently running? So we are currently in what we call phase three trials for treatment-resistant depression. So these are the two big late-stage trials that are the main trials that will be needed for regulatory approval. So given that, let's assume that everything comes up completely rosy and positive. How far away from a licensed treatment?
treatment could we be? And, and that's assuming that everything goes as well as it could do. These trials will take us roughly two and a half years to complete. And then you should allow one to two years for the regulatory process after that. So we're looking at four to five years away, theoretically. And do we have any idea how much it might cost? Because obviously there's a huge amount of research that's going into these clinical trials and there's cost of manufacturing the drugs themselves. The drugs then don't seem to work just as a drug. They need to be combined with therapy, which can take a long time as well. So how this doesn't sound cheap is basically the point that I'm getting to. (laughs) You're right. First, what we are studying is one administration infrequently. What we are looking at is probably only one every two to three months in the trials. We'll try and establish what that is. I I think our view is that by generating this evidence, what we want to do is to make this available to a lot of patients. But obviously, that will require a lot of discussion, negotiation with health systems in the UK and elsewhere in the world to make that possible. How big's the market? The patient numbers are huge, unfortunately. I think there is the potential for this to be psychedelics in general in time to be a pretty significant contributor to the treatments for serious mental illness. I've just seen figures in the tens of billions. (laughs) <laughs> and I just never know whether that's just someone plucking you out of thin air or, or a realistic projection of what it could be. I think it could be in that realm, but that's a long time away. I mean, just to be clear, we're the first company doing the last phase of trials right now. There are many other companies active in the field at a much earlier stage. Those sort of numbers are, I would say, decades away. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much, James. Pleasure. I think what's become clear from chatting to people who've been through the treatment like Ian as well as those researching it is psychedelics are not going to be a magic bullet. And yet up against that, there's this huge amount of hype. So I really am left wondering, are we keeping our feet on the ground here? So I put that to Liam Maudlin and first James Rucker. A huge amount of hype and with that hype comes risk because people read that, people who may be depressed and desperate. And a lot of hope is attached to that. But if then they experience a psychedelic and it doesn't work or it makes them worse, you have disappointment on top of that. And, and, and that's where the clinical risk can lie. And the how, high... do you, how do you balance that, though? Because there is also there is genuine excitement as well, yeah. though, isn't there? Because I... there's almost this thought that here's something that you can apply to people that all other treatments have failed. That is what's going to happen, is we're going to have this hype versus reality pendulum that will swing back and forth. But one of the exciting things about this is the way we're combining drugs with a therapeutic context. Liam, so you think that the amount of effort that goes in would still be worth it? I think so. I hope so. I think that part of the questions that we need to still ask and investigate is what are the long-term effects of these compounds and how people make use of their experience 12 months 18 months after treatment and we also have to figure out what this treatment might look like if approved in healthcare systems as in how many times do people need to get the treatment and what does this treatment model look like around that both of you thank you so much thank Thank you. you well the royal college of psychiatrists shares those sentiments it says these drugs may offer some hope in treatment resistant depression but says we're still at the stage where more extensive research needs to take place but it's of course an area in desperate need of new treatments so thank you to everyone especially ian that helped us explore the idea of psychedelic therapy go in and through had a tough week i needed that thank you we can spend more time here if needed. <laughs> uh, thank you.